elsewhere in the world. So welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for the first of our uh, EPTRI, that's the European Paediatric Translational Research Infrastructure uh, Medical Devices Thematic Research Platform uh, webinars, of which there'll be a series of webinars over the forthcoming year, every two months, um, essentially showcasing the, the latest technologies and themes around medical devices and child health technology research. My name is Paul Dimitri. I am uh, a professor of child health and consultant at Sheffield Children's Hospital in the UK. I'm also the director of the National Institute for Health and Care Research, Children and Young People's MedTech Cooperative. I'm the vice president of science and research at the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, and I head up the NHR uh, Children's uh, Re Clinical Research Network as the national clinical lead. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be hosting uh, this EPTRI webinar. Just briefly to tell you a bit about EPTRI. So EPTRI is a distributed research infrastructure that offers high quality services in basic preclinical and translational pediatric research. And EPTRI is composed of five thematic research platforms, um, which have been structured to enhance technology driven pediatric research in drug discovery and early pediatric medicines and device development. EPTRI has five thematic research platforms. I head up the uh, medical devices thematic research platform at EPTRI, which supports a focus on medical device development, deployment and adoption. So um, it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome three speakers. Our first speaker uh, who is going to speak to us today is David Cole. Uh, David is a friend and colleague who will be speaking to you about the innovation landscape across Children's Hospital, and he will highlight the challenges and opportunities. David is the co-founder of the children's charity Thinking of Oscar, which funds technology, uh, which funds technology and innovation within pediatrics, whose mission is to bring the future of healthcare to children. Thinking of Oscar was set up in memory of Oscar Cole, who sadly died suddenly in June 2014, aged just 16 months. Thinking of Oscar started off with the aim of supporting children and their families whilst in hospital care by funding projects and innova innovation over and above those supplied by the NHS. So, David, thank you ever so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing in your uh, presentation in this webinar. Thanks, Paul. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I, uh, I think we've done uh, the introduction, so we can kind of move forward to the first slide. So what Paul has asked me to um, discuss with everybody today is uh, is a piece of research that I actually did relatively recently, um, earlier this year, um, around looking at uh, the environment and resources required um, to bring innovation to children's health. Um, really, kind of looking at what we can do. For in order to garner a uh, a culture of innovation um, that that brings impact and sustainability, and whilst looking at this, um, also thinking about um, whether innovation within children's services should should differ from that of of general health services, and the um, and and the discussion that we're going to have or the uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today is really kind of looking at those findings and and thinking about some of the uh, aspects of of the conversations that I had during that research project. Um, next slide, please. So just um, um, given that this is a, a, a research um, audience, um, just to give you an idea as to um, how this was conducted. So um, it was it's very much a qualitative um, based research project um, looking at and using a thematic analysis um, when, when I was looking at my results. Um, I did start with a, a, a relatively um, broad kind of literature review, looking at both what is out there currently in the um, uh, in the ether, looking at innovation generally within healthcare, and then looking which sadly is less so um, at what is actually there from a, a children's health perspective in terms of best practice uh, across the across the board, and then uh, matching my findings to the literature that, that was out there. Um, uh, in terms of um, those kind of canvassed, so um, 
I, uh, as as is John, part of uh, an organization called iSpy, which is the International Society for Pediatric Innovation, uh, broadly set up in the US, but with uh, organizations across the world. Um, and I utilized the contacts that I had within that organization to, to basically seek out innovation units within children's hospitals um, across uh, the US um, and Canada, UK and, and Europe. Um, Given more time, uh, and, uh, and and actually I, I did have opportunities to speak to uh, organizations outside of those um, kind of continents, unfortunately time didn't allow it, but uh, um, looking to actually broaden that uh, as we go, as we move forward into uh, uh, in the future, as it was. Um, I did use kind of semi-structured interview techniques in order that it could be relatively fluid in terms of those um, questions asked. Um, and and uh, of the uh, ten interviewees, everyone was working within an innovation team, which is which is not um, necessarily uh, that broadly set up. Um, uh, it was certainly within children's health environment. Um, so, but but everyone was working within an innovation uh, environment, and all the hospitals um, probably goes without saying, but they were all given their children's units were all kind of non profits. From an ethical perspective. Um, Again, something that um, you know maybe we need to look at in the future. But that I didn't speak to any children or their families. I think that would have been a very important aspect of it. As you, you uh, everybody anonymized, so we're not going to go into who who we spoke to, um, and and who actually um, uh, gave gave some answers. But uh, but but uh, um, you know, hopefully they're they're, they're pretty um, good in terms of and broad in terms of the the feedback. Um, and one thing I had to kind of I guess struggle with, um, which you might look at, is just some of the confirmation bias that that maybe came out of this. And I think given where I think we'll hear in the rest of the sessions, and and certainly some of the things I'll discuss. Um, uh, in terms of the lack of funding that is in children's health, you know, everybody, yes, we're all trying to, you know, do similar things in terms of broaden and and uh, expand children's health innovation, but but really everybody's trying to do as best they possibly can, which I hope will mitigate some of that kind of confirmation bias. Um, I think largely the people that I spoke to, um, yes, you know, there's a lot of positives, but also there's a lot of learnings to take, and and really it's the start of of everything. So there's a lot to uh, to a lot of opportunity moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, just moving on to the kind of results, I guess. So um, the themes and sub themes that were identified. So um, and I'm going to go through mainly the, the, the major themes um, in this presentation. But but in order to really kind of or the findings that I found to look at um, bringing a sustainable and impactful um, innovation culture into a hospital environment, um, four key themes came up. One was opera operationalization. The other one's building an ecosystem, marketing that and really kind of promoting that. And then thinking about what impact are you going to provide as a result of that? And uh, next slide, please. And the sub themes um, which um, kind of intermingled here were around um, how do you collaborate and the importance of collaboration? Clearly the importance of funding, which um, I guess John is going to you know, touch on. Um, having a long-term thinking about this, certainly from a children's health perspective, and then having the right people and skills involved um, and, and you know why that is so important moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. And, and really this brought me to uh, come up with a uh, kind of um, a framework, looking at those four elements. Um, but but ultimately, if you could try these, these slides slightly built, so if we could just um, hit uh, return once. Ultimately, um, bringing all these things together um, provides what what um, you know what we look at as a culture of innovation. And in order to really kind of uh, in in terms of my findings and the feedback that I had, really kind of um, build on this, then then it is a case of bringing all these elements together to build a culture within the organisation that you're working with. Um, and importantly, um, next click, please putting children and the family at the center, which again, we're talking about children and, and young people here, so that won't come as a surprise. Um, and then one more, please. Thanks, <laughs> Bunker. Um, and then really kind of how this brings <laughs> together, you know, people and their skills. <laughs> <collaborate>. <laughs> um, and, and as I said, I will, I will build on that as we move forward. Next slide, please. Um, Really, you know, the two elements, uh, I think, in terms of takeaways uh, right at the beginning of this is that um, building a culture of innovation really comes with, and I think the difference between um, working within paediatrics and working with other healthcare um, is putting the children and their families at the centre of it. Now, we do talk, you know, in, in general healthcare about obviously putting the patient first, but actually there's a real opportunity 
to innovate with children and with families, which you don't necessarily yeah, have um, in in uh, more broader or uh, um, uh, healthcare settings. And that was certainly, you know, a big takeaway from the, uh, from the research. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at this in turn, so the operationalization of it, um, this, you know, was, it was absolutely a key finding. Um, and with that came the investment in key talent and, and actually feedback of, you know, how does one do this properly? Um, and the, some of that feedback is is really, you know, if you don't invest in the key talent, if you don't bring in those right skills, then then you know you're at a you're really kind of um, coming uh, at it from a from a, a losing position to begin with. Then it's um, implementing a systemic um, or systematic innovation process, and I'll go through a couple of ideas on that as as we move forward. Support from the top of an organization is really, really key here. And uh, interestingly, following um, uh, the, the the finalization of this report, I actually spoke to an organization, someone from an organization um, who had support from the top, had CEO support in setting up an innovation unit, had innovation, uh, CEO support from setting up an innovation culture. But then with a change of CEO came a change of trajectory. And that actually meant that it all fell by the wayside. Um, so that I think, you know, shows the uh, the importance of that kind of um, leadership from the top. Clinical support um, is obviously key. So um, looking at unmet needs, making sure that whatever we're doing in terms of new um, technologies, new pr um, processes, whatever it might be, has clinical support. Support. If it doesn't have that, if the clinicians aren't going to use it, um, if they're not going to get behind it, and patients are not going to use it, really, you know, the, the, there is little point in 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 you know doing it for for the sake of it. You need that clinical support, and then collaboration, which is a key theme throughout it, um, bringing that collaboration throughout the organisation, as we'll see, you know, outside the organisation as well. Um, and uh, you you can read the quote. I won't. I put a few quotes in here just in terms of some of that um, qualitative uh, uh, feedback that I had, um, which you can see. But you know, really, it's an opportunity to um, you know try and help clinicians um, moving forward and and understanding what those own met needs are, and then bringing that into that um, systematic approach. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there is, um, I think, really important to have that kind of iterative innovation process, starting with an idea and hoping then to take that into implementation. Um, you know, I said, you know, bringing in that kind of clinical mentor, clinical support, bringing in a prototype, research and development throughout, then before you really got to that kind of productization and, and the business ecosystem, if, you, if that's where you want to go to in terms of commercialization. But having that, you know, it doesn't need to necessarily um, follow this, this process, but having some form of process, I think, you know, uh, in terms of feedback was really, really key um, in terms of the research. Next slide, please. Another element is really understanding the opportunities, and John will go into these to a certain degree, but an opportunity of if you are bringing innovation into a hospital system or another clinical organization, then how do you uh, bring that to commercial opportunity, to impact? What are the opportunities that you have in order to do that? So, you know, you need a mechanism to feed in these uh, problems, these unmet needs, and then in order to distribute those, um, you know, do you bring uh do you create and solutionize them yourself do you productize it within house um, and then take it out to to the masses as it were do you find what is out there in the ether um in terms of current products and then bring that in and and, and utilize those or do you set up new revenue streams new opportunities to um uh, you know to look at um ways of um, funding this innovation or do you e even kind of set up new corporations and new organizations as a result a new uh, next slide please and then finally, you know, some of the work that I'm doing uh, with with some hospitals in the UK is really look, kind of looking at that commercialization process. So uh, similar to the iterative process, but really kind of looking at how do we bring impact reporting into that? How do we deploy it? How do you bring that marketing communications uh, side of things across the board? And then where do you identify barriers um, uh, to scale? And really, I think, especially within the pediatric landscape, um, it's so important sorry I lost you uh, it's so important to then have kind of uh, pilots and and fast friendly followers before you get into a kind of full licensing commercialization activity next slide please 
Um, then looking at um, uh, the ecosystem, which we've touched on a little bit, but but really it's thinking about how do you collaborate with everyone inside your hospital, as we've said, but other hospitals as well. And really importantly, um, the local community, potential partners and anything, anyone that could be impacted um, by uh, the innovations that you're looking at doing. Um, not every problem needs to be solved in-house, as we've said, you know, looking at how you can work with other organisations to help them move forward into um, and I think one of the um, some of the you know other research that I did is really every innovation um, that we can think of is not necessarily all about the product that you create. It's about bringing in that right ecosystem around it, uh, bringing in the right partners, being able to. You're not going to be able to do everything yourself, so it's you know being able to do that. And um, uh, given time, I won't expand on that too much. But uh, but I think um, as you can see again, you know another quote. There's there's lots of opportunity there, and it's just making sure that you understand what it what in what is around and what isn't. Uh, next slide, please. Um, marketing was something that was really lacking, actually, especially in the literature and something that, um, you know, I found in terms of conversations, which was really, really important. You need to be um, going out there and, and storytelling. Essentially, we hear there's quite a lot in, in the business world these days. How do you tell your story? How are you going to get people on board? How are you going to get people engaged with what you want to try and do? Children's health, you should, you know, we should be able to do that. And sadly, we don't do it as much as we can, but um, as much as maybe the opportunity is there. But but really, that's where marketing and consistency of marketing, consistency of sharing messages, you know, is so important. You're looking to inspire others, helping to raise funding, which is so, you know, again, very important, which which I guess John will touch on um, and really kind of drawing on that empathy side of things. Um, but continuing to spread that message is is, you know, is so important um, and really kind of thinking about what is the mission that you're trying to um, uh, to look at um, and how can that have an impact on a child's life it was interesting one of the anecdotal elements that i had was you know should we be doing something for one child um and the overarching uh, uh kind of response was absolutely we should um it might not be you know as financially uh financial opportunity as we want it to be but but we should be looking at you know those opportunities um given the the longer term impacts um social economic impacts of you know a child's life and therefore society and you you know, you grow that and, and bring that up. It makes a, a tremendous amount of difference. Um, next slide, please. Um, and and finally, from the uh, I guess macro elements of it, um, impact is 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 truly you know um, I think one of the key elements to to look at. Again, this was not particularly relevant from a literature perspective. There was a lot of qualitative elements of people looking at different ways of of measuring impact. Not a lot of qualitative side of things. Um, sorry, quantitative side of things. So that is something that you know I'm working on with 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 other organisations. And I think you know. Um, and it really comes from agreeing how to measure impact right at the beginning of innovation, right at the beginning of setting up an innovation unit, right at the beginning of setting up or looking at, you know, productizing something. Um, and it needs to come from the top down again, you know, having that agreement um, and, and looking at it. And it needs to also be looking at um, uh, a long term impact as well from a from a children's health perspective. You know, generally we're looking at obviously the pediatric environment is between zero and 18. Um, you know, could be as little as 20 percent of someone's life um, or, or 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 less. So, um, you know, the cost of opportunity moving forward is vast. And therefore, it really comes down to a thought on return on mission versus return on investment. And I think this is a, a relatively new um, uh, paradigm that, 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 again, haven't seen in other um, other sides of, of healthcare, certainly from a literature perspective. Um, and uh, and, you know, Again, thinking about this kind of over time and uh, and and how do we measure this um, effectively is is really important. And there's there's lots of you know different ways that people are looking at that uh, at this point in time. Again, due to time constraints, probably not going to go into that um, in too much detail. I'm afraid. Next, next slide, please. Really, um, kind of coming coming to a close to a certain degree. Um, all of this really kind of helps to construct sustainability. Um, I'm not saying that you need to put everything in place in order to do that, but really kind of thinking about what is the culture that you wish or an organization wishes to, to put out there? What is the goals? What is the mission of that um, uh, organization? And, um, uh, you know, really kind of the opportunity to bring, you know, a number of these things, if not everything together will, um, you know, 
hopefully give that kind of sustainable approach if you look at it from a long-term perspective you bring the right ecosystem your marketing and you've got that operationalized side of things then then impact should should hopefully follow and the other interesting thing i guess given the time uh, period that we've just had coming out of covid was there was a lot of innovation that happened over the course i mean you know even just the uh, um of these the, the vaccines and how quickly they they came to uh, um to, to the fore you know with given what's happened previously but but um transformational change requires disastrous crisis i wanted to put that in there because it was a, it was it wasn't just one person giving me this um feedback there was a number of people that said actually COVID has been, you know, the 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 litmus paper needed for radical innovation, uh, both within healthcare, and and I think unfortunately we're probably seeing a decline in that to a certain degree. If you think about, you know, um, how that might look on a graph, we need to make sure that that's continuing in children's health, um, because you know really it's been at the the bottom of the run for too long. Next slide, please. Coming back then and kind of bringing it all all together um, again, thinking about that 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 culture bringing all the different elements together and um, most importantly, putting children and their families right at the centre of it. And, uh, you know, if I had uh, more time and, and hopefully in the future I will, you know, I would want to be talking to to children and and um, and uh, and their families about, you know, the impact of of uh, different innovations, what they would like to see, what um, unmet needs they are um uh, you know, experiencing if they're having to, unfortunately, um, experience hospital care, um, what we can be doing in terms of preventative care measures as well. Um, all of these things, um, you know, kind of came out as a part of uh, a part of the feedback and the research. Next, next slide, please. And and um, a little plug for uh, um, my own uh, podcast, but but actually. This was um, un, uh, unplugged, as it were, during the conversations that I had in the research. But many, many, many people came out with children and not many adults. You know, there's a lot of innovations that have taken place, um, as I'm sure Paul can attest to, um, that have been adult first and they've been scaled down to children. Um, you know, we're still seeing it. We're still seeing it today. And I think the opportunities to actually do children first and scale up to adults, given the physiological differences between zero and 18, zero and 21, you know, really does give us a really uh, an outstanding and, and, and relatively untapped opportunity to, um, you know, to look at children's children's health um, very, very positively. And I think this last statement in the pink you know, the earlier that we can impact a children's life, um, the better that we can, uh, or the more dramatically we can, you know, alter the course of that person's life if, if they are um, unwell. And um, the social economic impacts of that are still being looked at. And I think, again, you know, a very important element of, of what should be coming next. Uh, next slide, please. And I think that is just on time, Paul. So um, hopefully... And that gives a, a, a brief overview as to um, the research um, that I've conducted. If anyone would like to speak to me more or, or learn a bit more, then, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. David, thank you ever so much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And every time I listen to you, I always learn something or many things new from what I heard before. So it's really great to listen. I've got a number of questions I'm going to ask you at the end anyway, because uh, it was a fascinating presentation. And, and also... I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but if anybody does have any questions, if you just pop them in the chat, please, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentations, inviting all the our speakers to come back in and uh, to answer some of the questions. As I say, I've certainly got a few already. So thank you, David. No problem. So our next speaker, our second speaker of the webinar is uh, Maria Sanchez Ahmad, who is going to speak to you about uh, how both the academic and industry sectors can benefit from the public procurement for innovation. Maria works at the European Institute for Tech, uh, U European Institute for Technology and Innovation uh, in Health as an Open Innovation Program Manager. Her work covers the design, development, and implementation of state-of-the-art open innovation and business acceleration programs. Thank you, Maria, for joining us today. I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to share my screen or Bonka, are you going to do it for me? If you give me the permits. I or... have. I'm already sharing your presentation. I don't know if you can see it. No. Uh, does anybody else can see my screen? We can see your screen. Bonka, David, is that you're not sharing. So Bonka, if you're sharing at the moment, David's presentation is still on your screen. Yes. All right, so let me retry then. Sorry for that. 
Okay. Yeah, I understood which was the problem. Yeah. There we go. That's it. Sharing now. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. One second. Uh, I'm gonna. So. Oui. Sorry, but I can. Oh. I think you'll have to ask Bonka to do next slide if you want to. Okay. Yes. To move on, Maria. Yep. So, so thank you very much, Paul and and all the team from Eptree for this invitation today to participate in this webinar. And as uh, David was was saying, you now in this first slide we can pass it. I would like to uh, start in the next slide, please, Monka, uh, talking about um, EIT Health. Because I don't know if you know the organization, but EIT Health and is very linked to to you know the key elements that David was commenting is a an ecosystem, is a community of health innovation innovators across Europe that are backed by the European Union. So we are uh, founded by the uh, the European Union. We are an agency for innovation, and we work across the borders of the EU to bring uh, the, the innovators and, and key uh, people no? and, and key uh, talent in the business research, education, and healthcare uh, delivery to respond to the main challenges in, in health and being one of them, of course, children's health. So in the next slide, mm, we are composed of a, a, a big number of partners and we are uh, present in all these European countries, um, being Spain, France, UK, Ireland, Belgium, Scandinavia and Germany and Austria, the main hubs, but also represented in the Innostar region with Portugal, Italy, so majority of the countries uh, participate in it. And we are participated by industrial leaders, universities, healthcare system, health technology assessment uh, agencies, patients, associations. So we have pretty much all stakeholders represented in our community. In the next slide, so just uh, our impact, we are also looking for, for impact and uh, we, what we do is to, we contribute in the innovation pathway, and I will explain it a bit later, by uh, founding or co-founding innovation projects and also uh, providing uh, support for bringing products to market. So here there are some numbers of more than 120 projects. These numbers come from 2022. We are closing this year still. But uh, we have also accelerated uh, uh, more than 1,000 startups and uh, we invest, we have a, a direct investment tool, but also uh, we, with our investment being early investors, we attract additional investment for, for our accelerated startups or uh, partners. And we also provide educational programs and we uh, we go directly with uh, individuals, innovators, but also to professionals doing upskilling, uh, training, and contributing to what not David was saying of the culture of innovation and the culture of uh, looking for impact and changing the way to collaborate with different uh, ecosystem and co-create uh, the the unmet needs identification or the definition of the value proposition for an innovation. So in the next slide, please. So in a nutshell, uh, we, are, we have seven colocation centers and 10 uh, in, uh, in the star countries participating. We are an open community with all stakeholders represented. We uh, promote public-private collaboration. So we also enable uh, and create a, a safe environment to operate in this type of, of um, uh, businesses. 
and we uh, provide with support programs in education, business acceleration, and innovation. So, uh, in that sense, um, uh, we think that we count with, in the next slides, with a, a, a real ecosystem that uh, we can um, use and put it as a service because it's our day daily business to uh, complete or to promote different type of activities in all the innovation pathway. So we can provide with capacity building and knowledge sharing. We can support in marketing and network events. We also have a public affairs team that uh, is focused on informing policymakers and trying to bring um, outcomes of different programs or findings uh, into the, the, the policy area. As, as a comment by Paul before, we have open innovation programs. So obviously it's demand-driven innovation and by demand, uh, I, I agree you now with David that we need to start with an unmet need and we need to involve all the stakeholders. And also in the very beginning, uh, we provide with some market analysis. We, we support the companies in understanding what is the real value proposition and how to build a, a business model around and a business uh, development to, to really um, get the innovation adopted and uh, penetrate in the market. And we do it uh, through business acceleration programs. So we have the capacity to scout and select innovation providers and also bring them uh, in front of investors for access to finance. So um, now talking more about uh, in the next slide, sorry about the innovation path and how we see it and, and how we cover. In EIT Health, we cover all the innovation paths. So we want to take technology developed in the academia into the hands of the patient, okay? And into the hands of the patient is not into the market is into really the final user of the technology and for that for this to happen we want to collaborate or we collaborate with technology transfer offices and, and entrepreneurs through the innovation process to bring the innovation to the market and to understand from the very beginning where is the unmet need how the how they need to pivot or understand others' perspective. And, and also we support, them we support them in the venture building by creating consortia, by upscaling professionals, validating the value proposition, et cetera, et cetera. So all in all, what we want to ensure is the impact in terms of value and benefit for the patients and society. So, if you see in the level of uncertainty, so uncertainty of innovation decreases when more real world evidence is generated. So at the beginning of the innovation pathway, there is a high risk of, of uncertainty for innovation, procurers, investors. So really this decreases as the more real world evidence is generated. So, and real world evidence is only generating through the implementation of their solutions in real settings, such hospitals, clinics, home, home cares, et cetera, et cetera. And all that influences the way innovation is funded for public funding schemes in these early stages to more of a later stage venture capital interest or uh, fundraising. And, uh, for EIT Health, as a public entity, we support to generate, we support innovation in generating evidence along this pathway to lower the risk uh, of investment uh, and to uh, incentivize other financial support. So what we want is to support using available instruments or future instruments to come, for example, 
a public procurement of innovation or even the pre-commercial procurement of innovation that public institutions use to procure innovation for impact. But beyond that, to generate also and integrate additional supports, activities, co-financings that will facilitate and speed up the implementation of this financial instrument. So, uh, all in all, in, in my next slide, I wanted to show you here how the public procurement of innovation uh, is divided. And uh, so the pre-commercial procurement financial instruments has three different phases and, and they left out the initial one. There is the needs identification, but it's a key part in any case. So what they do is they work together with uh, different partners, procurers, and research center uh, to really detect where is the unmet need and identify really where, what is the problem and the challenge they want to overcome. Giving free uh, the, to the market to provide or to answer to this request by a solution. So they open a call and they support in a competitive process a certain no number of uh, solutions. And in the first phase, they need to design the solution and, and complete a, a, a portfolio of, of key elements that they want to put in place for overcoming this challenge. So how they are going to do it and how they are going to develop the prototype and test a certain amount of prototypes of services into the real world setting. And later on, there is a gap uh, because the procurement of innovation, the public procurement of innovation only take place when there is already a commercial available product or service that they want to deploy in a certain number of hospitals before going to a wide diffusion. So for us, if you look at the innovation path that uh, a company needs to follow, that it starts from the technology development and then go goes over the innovation solution design, the prototype, CE mark, the, the piloting of the solution, it, there is also here a gap that it needs uh, time and sometimes a uh, support, external support that is the regulatory approval, the integration of the solution in a, in a real setting, the health technology assessment. Also, as David was commenting, the measuring of the value, not just qualitatively, but also quantitatively, and um, uh, all that it will be needed for a real future procurement and the procurement strategy. So, uh, now we are um, very involved in this type of um, projects and supporting the European Commission into the, the definition of these new ways of procuring innovation. And also we uh, have in the next slide, we uh, have a new coordination and support action project uh, in, in pediatrics that is called Ad for Kids, where we collaborate or, or the coordinator is San Joan de Deu, and we are uh, six more partners, uh, ECHO, that is the European Children's Hospital Organization, us, EIT Health, AQUAS, there is the Health Technology Assessment Agency of Catalonia, a hospital and innovation center in Poland, Cienciano, that is the link to the Ministry of Health in Belgium for the reimbursement of in and procurement of innovation and in Benian, that is a consultancy of innovation. So what we are going to start in January 2024 is we are going to do a, a cycle or, or an iterative process where uh, we will uh, detect the pediatric ecosystem needs and barriers for innovation adoption based on a stakeholder analysis. And then from there, we will uh, 
uh, support or, or do an analysis of the pediatric innovation adoption mechanisms and financial instruments. So when that means how we can adapt the ISPRE commercial procurement of innovation and the public procurement of innovation uh, for pediatrics. And with that, we and, and with this finding in an iterative process, we would like to co-design a European action plan for a fast tracking of pediatric innovation adoption. So just a heads up because uh, the project will last one year and hopefully uh, we can advocate for this action plan uh, to the European Commission for this fast tracking of pediatric innovation adoption. Uh, also, I would like to give you some opportunities that we have opened now for collaborating. So we have some fast track for EIT Health uh, startups that can access to EIC acceleration programs. So if any of you have participated in any of our programs, we can you can apply for our support in presenting an EIC accelerator uh, proposal. We also have some mentoring and coaching networks. This is very important for, um, as, as uh, David was saying, for this marketing, how we pitch, how we tell our story, how we create a, a, a storytelling around our solution and how we can convince investors to, to participate in our solution and, and support us. We also have a, a gold track project program open for accelerating a, um, and growth and massive scalable healthcare companies. Basically, this is open. If we are agnostic to to the the, the topic, so we we really are open for biotech solution, medtech uh, devices, and also digital solutions. So this is also an opportunity for collaborating. We also support um, to, to turn your research into a business idea. So how we can, you can venture, you can build a venture around your research and how this could become a feasible and impact uh, the, final, um, the final patient. Also, we have uh, educational programs, digital entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship in digital health. We also have an acceleration of digital health uh, tech apps. And finally, uh, exactly as David, if you want to contact me or you want to check in the EIT Health uh, webpage for this opportunity in innovation or write me if you want to participate somehow in any of our programs uh, or this project in pediatrics, uh, I'm more than happy to contact with you and to get contact. Maria, thank you ever so much for a great presentation. It's, it's fantastic to hear about all, all the work, the great work that you're doing in EIT health, and also to hear the more recent focus on child health technology and digital innovation. So again, I've got a number of questions I'd like to ask you, particularly around about the, the European fast tracking, which sounds very exciting. So uh, I'll, I'll hopefully revisit that in the, the Q&A session. So thank you again, Maria. So, ladies and gentlemen, our last speaker is John Parker. Uh, John is has uh, joined us from the US and will provide you uh, with practical tips and examples on the journey to get your child health technology research funded. So that sounds very exciting. John is the founder and managing partner of Springhood Ventures in the US, which invests in life science and healthcare companies, transforming uh, the health and care of children and young people. Thank you, John. Thanks, Paul. I'm struggling with my mute button a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, John. Just a wee um, bit there for a second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, thanks for having me again. Um, and it's uh, it's fantastic to see everyone here. Um, and uh, I will try to add a little bit to a couple of really just fantastic presentations. And I think there, you'll see some overlap between um, some of the things I think about and uh, so, some of the really important points that David and Maria touched on here. Um, let me go um, 
I think Palmer, maybe we go back one slide. Um, I just want to give um, just it, it's worth just even though Paul introduced me a little bit, just give a little background as to how I came to children's health and how I think about it. Um, so I am a, a career investor. I've been in, in and around the alternative investment space my whole life, um, venture capital, private equity, hedge funds, things like that. Um, I got into children's health through a foundation here in Boston. Uh, I'm a trustee there and uh, this foundation that supports pediatric researchers. So I came at it from a sort of grant maker, uh, philanthropic perspective. Uh, a few years into my time at the foundation, we identified really, I, I need to get closer to the patient. We saw too many good technologies, too much good science that wasn't actually reaching kids. So we jumped into the the venture space and I took that on because uh, it fit, fit my background. Um, but the initial uh, approach was, well, it's impact first, it's pediatrics, it's uh, uh, it's hard to make money here. Uh, we, we just need to, you know, come at it with a this sort of concessionary mentality to try to move things along. Um, but I've been doing this for eight years now. Um, I've invested in 17 com companies uh, for drugs, devices, digital health, diagnostics. Uh, and over these years, I have seen a massive increase in the number of, of companies uh, coming to market, seeing some uh, amazing technologies. Uh, and all of, you know, as I got into this, I realized that there are amazing return opportunities. There are great investment opportunities. This doesn't need to just be a an impact first or a venture philanthropy story. Um, and so that's uh, that it led me to to Springhood and setting up uh, going going after this space with a, a full on goal of of making good solid investment returns while moving this pediatric mission forward. Um, so just uh, it, it's worth touching on that as I think about some of the. The, the different ways you fund things and such. So let's go now to the, the next uh, slide. And I'll, what I'll do here first is just share a little bit about how I as an investor think about funding uh, ideas, companies, uh, ventures, et cetera. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump to the next slide. Um, as an investor, my goal here is actually really, and, and it comes from my roots in of how I got into pediatrics. My goal is to get solutions to patients, to kids sustainably and at scale. Um, part of what makes that happen is working on the economics and getting returns to investors because you need money around this. But the real goal is to, uh, and any you know, good venture capitalist should be trying to do the same thing. They're trying to solve a problem, get a solution to people who need it. And uh, the pediatric space is such a great space, uh, sector to be doing that in. Um, but it takes a lot of things. And what I'm going to do is touch on it's, and it's going to be sort of high level, but touch on some of the big things that I think about um, when I go through this process. And it's going it, to, it's starting with just, you know, wh why are you doing it to begin with? You can talk about the technology itself a little bit, what the, the, the nuts and bolts of the solution, um, the people you need to to put to bring together to make it happen. Um, money, of course, is an important part of it, a vital part of it, uh, but also just the thinking and planning. And you've got to get really plan and uh, uh, put together a model that works all the way through to the end. Um, and if it, it the, the pieces don't add up, you've, you're gonna have to go back to the drawing board. Um, so let me just jump in a, a little bit. And this isn't, the things I'm going to step through is this uh, little diagram indicates it's it's not a linear process, um, even though I'm going to sort of start with the, the the highest level here. But this is an iterative process uh, to figuring out how to go to market, how to raise money, how to design this company and your strategy. Um, so let me go to the next slide. Um, you've heard this now, uh, uh, both David and Maria, uh, but let me talk about the story a little bit. Uh, why are why does this exist? Uh, why, you know, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it now? Why hasn't it been done already? Um, when, as an investor, when I hear about new things, this story about why you as a, whether you're a founder, a, uh, an inventor, an innovator, or you're a hired gun CEO, you know, why you're doing this is one of the most important things for me, and it helps you stand out among the hundreds of other 
uh, opportunities that I look at. And this has to be really compelling. Uh, if you're, this is a hard thing to say sometimes in, around children's health, but I do see situations where people are like, well, it, it, somebody just needs to do it. Um, and I don't think that's quite enough. Um, there are hundreds of things that somebody needs to do, and they're all great solutions. Uh, but why do you have the passion for it? Why are you going to uh, stick with this and make sure it gets to the finish line? Um, and, and I see fantastic stories about why people joined a company, and maybe it's a late career move, and say, you know, I, th this is just something I, I now have the skills and the insights to make something like this happen, whereas it might have been too hard before. Um, you see fantastic stories about uh, founders who have, because of uh, something that happened to uh, a family member, to one of their kids, they are, are building a company to solve a problem they saw. Uh, those are fantastic stories too, um, but it has to be your story. Um, one of the so my, the portfolio we've invested in, the, the 17 companies I've invested in over the years, we've only had one company go out of business in eight years. And I think, which is a great testament to the stories and the staying power, the dedication, perseverance that people have in this space. Uh, it's one of the things that makes it such an attractive investment area for me. Um, you, you don't find this in all areas of certainly technology, investing, but but even across other areas of healthcare. Um, Next slide. Okay. Um, so the solution, everybody's got this. Uh, it, it's sort of, it, this, this part seems, you know, everybody comes to the table with something that's a, a product or service. Um, uh, it, you don't have much without it. Uh, but how I think about this is, uh, I just want to give a little insight into that. Uh, whatever it is that you've developed to solve a problem, um, I will look at this in terms of, is the unmet need there? Is it a validated unmet need? Um, something that not just that, that you might see a little opportunity, but is are people talking about this? Is there data that supports the need out there? You need to be able to bring that to me and explain it to me. Um, I'm going to look to see if it's technologically feasible. Can you build it? Can you create it? Uh, do you have evidence that it works? Um, and look, there are there's often a chicken and egg with the evidence. Uh, you know, sometimes you need some funding, you need some support and some people to get that evidence. But hopefully fairly early on, you've at least got something that shows uh, that there's a there there. Um, uh, and as the company evolves and grows, you keep building upon this. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. Um, and at the end of the day, does this solution, whatever you're developing to help kids, does it add net value, and this is a little bit of a tricky concept, but it is add net value to all stakeholders across the, uh, the, the ecosystem that is required to have on board to get this, uh, this solution to market. Um, you can have something that improves outcomes, but if it loses massive amounts of money or it is impossible to fit into the workflow, uh, then it's, it's, it's not a net value add. You, you want to have uh, all the different pieces in place where, yes, it helps patients, but it makes doctors and nurses' lives easier. It's something that helps for uh, if you need to uh, you know, integrate with the IT department. Is it something they can manage without uh, uh, making their lives miserable? Uh, and can you, you know, do the economics of it work out so that the, the folks who are helping to fund this, they see it as value add and they're winning too? Um, uh, and just to touch it, this is sort of a slightly different point, but, uh, and, and um, we heard this uh, in one point earlier, but there are a lot of things that add real value, um, but it's hard to capture that value in, in the, this solution as an asset. And we see it a lot. Unfortunately, we see it a lot on the preventative care side where there's massive long-term value that is accrued to, to kids when if you can have uh, an intervention early in a person's life, the net present value of that intervention is uh, almost infinite when you talk about somebody who may have uh, 80 years in front of them, uh, but you still need to figure out how to capture some of that value and get paid. Uh, and that's unfortunately the reality of it. There are situations where you can um, uh, 
find a, I'll call it a workaround uh, and get to do it with philanthropy. There, there are ways to fund that uh, with philanthropy and you don't need to charge much, but usually you need to capture some of those economics just to be a sustainable business. Um, and let me finish up on this section, come back. It's always important to keep in mind this question of why are you doing this with kids? Um, and there are investors, hospitals, every, there are a lot of forces that will push you, regulators, they'll push you to towards adults uh, frequently. You want to have really good reasons why kids, why pediatrics is the best place to start with whatever your solution is and why you're going to do it now. Otherwise, the story will start to fall apart. Um, next slide. Uh, absolutely critical here. Uh, for a lot of the things that I, I suspect this audience is thinking about, it's early in this process. Um, and you'll be thinking more about building teams uh, in the future. Uh, and you'll have just a very small group right now. But uh, he's, here are just some of the things that I think about. I don't need necessarily the world's experts, somebody who's done this 10 times and exited, uh, uh, had, had massive yeah, exits and wins for their investors. All those things are good. I like them. Uh, but as core, we look for smart people, people who work really hard and they've got integrity. Can we trust them? Um, as we go along, it's we want people who are on board with building a team that has the skills and experience. But at the beginning, can you just get it going and you know can you will you work your butt off and uh uh do whatever it takes to get there next slide um money which is the the big question around um the funding and this plays in with in the next section is is about planning but um th these two sort of go hand in hand understanding how much money it will take to get your solution all the way to whatever the end point is, is important. Um, that end point, if you have investors, might be an exit. If it's if you are bootstrapping and have grant funding, it may just be to break even so you have a sustainable business. Uh, there, there's some different options there. But you want to know how much money it will take along the way to reach different milestones and to get to the finish line. Um, that will help inform where you're going to get the money. Um, you have options to get some grants around what you're doing. And early on, when you're still looking for some of the things like the evidence that I talked about, grants can be critical uh, because the in investors doesn't have has nothing to do with being pediatric or not. People are, are you know, want to know that something's going to work before they put money in. So if you can get some evidence, that's helpful. Um, and as you move through the stage and start looking at investors for your solution, it's really critical to find the right kind of investors. One of the things that I hear in the pediatric space uh, a lot is, you know, we go out to the market and venture capitalists don't like pediatrics. They, you know, they won't give us money, so they don't like pediatrics. Um, yet I, too often what I see is folks that, um, will they're trying to raise a couple million dollars they've got a relatively simple me uh, medical device uh, focused on infants or you know another pediatric market and they're sending their pitch deck to the top 100 venture capital firms uh in the us uh you know and maybe they've dialed in and folk find the ones that do healthcare. uh not understanding that most of these firms just can't do investments that are under 50 million dollars each and when they're looking for two million uh it, it, they'll say that's not investable what they mean is not investable for us um if you need that kind of money you need to be going to angels small funds families uh if and finding folks for whom that investment size lines up well um a big investment fund uh will choose you know, to make, give an example if you've got an opportunity where you know, your your company needs five million dollars and you think you can uh, get a $100 million exit on this based on some comps you've seen in the marketplace, uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. It's a 20x return. It's very appealing. But you may find that uh, 
a, a venture fund will turn that down for an investment uh, that is a company that's raising $300 million and has prospects for a $3 billion exit. And that's a 10x return. Um, but they need to move large sums of money. Uh, and so the smaller deal, although it looks like a much better return, just they can't do it. And I see too many folks in the, the pediatric space uh, sort of fall into that trap where they're thinking people don't like pediatrics. And, you know, well, what they don't like is the smaller deal or um, uh, you know, not being able to to put large amounts of money to work. So you just need to find the right investors, which is easier said than done, I realize. Um, and you've got to go to the the folks whose names aren't plastered all over the internet. Um, but it's it's a good fit and you can still do very well for them uh, under the right circumstances. Um, and also, uh, I th finish up, understand what your own expectations are around um, as, a, as founders, as innovators, people who may be involved in as shareholders of the company, what are your expectations? Uh, and does the math work out for what you want? Um, can you can the business support you as a uh, career wise? Uh, are you willing to take some risk on that? Uh, and can you do that and still provide all the people who fund it with what they're looking for? Um, it's worth mentioning a lot of investors. You know, when I look at something sort of at the low end, I want to see a five x return on my money at a minimum. There's some things I'll touch on it a little bit that I want a lot higher return or at least the expectations of returns um so you need to think understand what investors are looking for and as you put the your plan together figure out how to how to provide that um next slide because i'm talking about plan some i think one of the things that is most important to me is i speak to entrepreneurs uh and companies or in their earliest stages is really developing this plan and understanding what the entire journey looks like, not the journey just to uh, to get through uh, you know, product development and then we'll figure it out from there, not just to get uh, regulatory approval and then we'll figure it out from there, but all the way through um, for whatever you know, your investors or you may want to see. And if it's how do we help you know, change, improve outcomes for kids sustainably and at scale, what does it take to get there? Um, and that is all the tasks, all the people, all the money, putting together strong plans and strong models, financial and e economic models around that. And does it all add up? Does everybody come out of it with benefit and gain according to the things they're they're looking for? And as you go through this and work through some of the, these other things I've talked about, um, you iterate. And you do it again um, and fi figure out, is it the best path? Is it the greatest business story? And is it a great investment story, too, that you can go out to the marketplace with? And if some of the if any of those come back as a no, go back and do it again. And ultimately, you want to have yeses for all that to move forward with uh, with the company and build it and raise money and go to market with it. Um, Again, a lot of these things are not pediatric specific. They're really, it's sort of general inv investment uh, strategy. Um, but part of my lens is to always come back and look at this uh, around my thesis is, does the pediatric angle make it better? Is it, I don't want to get caught in a trap where a little further down the road, another investor is going to come in and say, oh, you know, this pediatric piece is... Um, it's nice that you're doing it, but we're going to you know, do better as investors if we pivot over to the adult market. Uh, and that's uh, not something I, I want to see. If it's what a company has to do to be successful, uh, you can't really stand in the way of that. But I don't want to get into a company where that's a likely uh, a likelihood. I want to find situations where the pediatric piece makes it a better business story. Um, that's what I do. Um, next slide. Um, I sort of talked about this a little bit. So you, you go through it and you just, you, you keep iterating, uh, until you get the numbers that work, uh, and you can find the right, you can match up the right funders, investors, and it looks like you, you you've got a good, good line of sight on how to get to that end game. Um, and the next slide, 
um, this is this is the goal. Um, you're going to create something that helps patients, improves outcomes. You can put together the right team to get it to patients. You raise enough money to do it. You sell it, you commercialize it, um, and you've created something of value and rewarded your investors along the way. Um, everyone's a winner if you can do that. Uh, that's the goal. Um, next slide. I think I'm I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over this just because in the interest of time. So let me just go to part two because I think this could be of interest. Um, let me just talk real quickly about where I see opportunities and how I think about some of the investments. Um, so the areas that I invest in uh, are, uh, I, I split into three fairly even buckets. Uh, one is simple solutions. These, uh, these tend to be sort of low cost medical device and software solutions. They don't take a ton of money to develop. The regulatory path is, is pretty simple. The scientific and technical risk is pretty low. Uh, and sales don't tend to require too many layers of approvals to get the sale done. Um, this is the low hanging fruit bucket for me. Uh, these, I, I like to populate my, my porf about a third of my portfolio with these. I think these are, uh, they, they return money fairly reliably. I think they, 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 there's no reason why they shouldn't work. It's just a matter of executing, um, uh, you know, sales, manufacturing, some of the the, the very basic uh, things. And there's a ton of uh, solutions in the pediatric space because there are just so many ignored problems. And there are a lot of little companies and uh, that can actually do really well. We had one this year that exited. Uh, a company never raised more than a couple million dollars, but we did really well with it. Uh, it was a, you know, it was a simple medical device, no electronics, uh, you know, silicone and adhesives, uh, and it solved a, a, a problem and uh, it, they got acquired fairly easily. It was, uh, it was a nice, simple solution. Um, the second bucket is I, I look at things that take a little more work, but again, they, um, uh, the, the there's a, maybe a little more scientific or technical risk uh, and, and and some some regulatory risk as well, uh, including poss the possibility of having to do clinical trials. But they, this is still in the med tech software space, maybe some drug repurposing, but yeah, we're we're pretty comfortable that it works. Just going to take a, a little more to get there. Uh, selling is a little tougher because you may have to go through value analysis committees and such. Just uh, a little more work in the uh, uh, to get them there, and we would expect a little higher return. A lot of these things also have great potential in the adult market once we can figure it out in Pete. So we like that where we can get it. Um, and then finally, we do some moonshots. Uh, we you know take some things that have a little more binary outcome. Uh, when the, these are you know drugs, uh, some drug discovery things where you know the science we, we we need to figure it out and if it works the upside's huge uh if it doesn't it goes to zero um and we like some of those too but we really focus on things that um where there's real benefit in being in the pediatric space so we can do it faster cheaper hopefully for a lot less money um by going through a pediatric first um and finally uh next slide just to talk about some of the things that are when I think about themes that are exciting to me um, in, in what captures my attention, it's not so much around particular sectors or indications, uh, because I'll look across indications. Uh, it, it's more the nature of the investment. So the first one is I really like things where there's a moral imperative to buy it. Uh, you improve outcomes enough that it, uh, you know, if, if you can provide good evidence of that and you are improving those outcomes, people, hospitals, clinicians, whoever's the, you get advised, they have to, um, that appeals to me. Um, if you can do that with kids, people have to buy, uh, and that's an appealing, uh, strategy. Um, pediatric advantage. We talk a lot about the hurdles in the pediatric space, um, but there are great advantages to it too. There are, um, yeah, this can be near as where there's, there's lack of competition. You've got legislated incentives, but it could be you know, fast tracking things. There are financial incentives, uh, certainly in the U.S. with priority review vouchers on the drug side. Um, so anything that allows us to get to market 
faster and for less money because we're going down a pediatric path, that's a great theme to go after. Um, and also there are a lot of things where it, the science leads you to focusing on kids before adults. Uh, the solution works better with kids. You may have some potential in adults, but uh, there are a lot of things that just work better with kids. Uh, and as long as you can do it safely, uh, it, it's a, it can be a great place to start. Um, we also look for a lot of pediatric first mo business models. Um, some of the markets we do look at, they they are small, as people could often talk about with pediatrics. Um, but we like things that have great potential to prove out in, in, first in pediatrics, get a solution to market, and then take it out to adult markets. Um, and then the one broader technology area that's got me pretty excited is the what's going on with processing power, um, and whether it's AI or things people, uh, the hot topics people are talking about now. It, for me, this is really just uh, the ability to do more faster for less money uh, and get global reach. So it's expanding uh, processing power and the, the changes there. Uh, it's expanding markets for us so we can reach people all over the world, kids all over the world, fast, cheap, easy. Um, uh, you can reach uh, poor patients, rich patients, whoever. It, it, it's the things that are happening there are fantastic. I think a lot of the computing, uh, yeah, anything, that, any solution that is heavily digital, of course, has a fantastic uh, uh, sort of safety uh, story to it, too, where we can maybe impact uh, outcomes in a way that an invasive device or a drug, we'd be a little nervous about doing it. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that area. Um, so I'll wrap up. I'm sure I'm over time here. Um, you go just uh, that last slide. So um, thank you. Really want to just convey my enthusiasm for the pediatric space. It's been uh, just such an amazing place to work. I think there are going to be great returns. They're not all going to, you know, not every pediatric company is going to provide great returns, but there are going to be some amazing winners that come out of the pediatric space. Um, I'm seeing hundreds and of companies every year doing amazing things. Um, I'm lucky I get to pick from, you know, just a few of them. So I'm pretty confident they're going to do very well. Um, but I also see other folks coming in and uh, there's more and more interest in the, in the space because there's so many great companies that are being built. Uh, and there are, of course, you know, important unmet needs uh, to be addressed. So thank you very much. Um, sorry, Paul, if I ran over a little bit, um, I will hand it back. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks very much. And please don't apologize for running over. It was a fascinating presentation. And I've heard you speak a, a number of times now, and I'm always riveted as, as to what you have to say. So thank you very much for, for sharing all that information. <clears throat> so just in the last 15 minutes or so, um, I just thought we'd uh, run a Q and A session, and I, I've got lots of questions. But please feel free either to pop your your screen on and your hand up, or uh, pop in um, uh, a question in the chat. John, as as we finish with you, I'm going to start with you. Um, and it's really something I've I've heard, which is that you know, this came from uh, a colleague of mine who heads up a, a VC company who was at the JP Morgan conference in uh, New York this year and said for the first time, child health technology was featured. And it, the question is as to whether child health technology and digital innovation in child health is really the new kid on the block now that people are waking up, the investors are waking up to what has been an opportunity around for probably nearly a decade, but actually the opportunity has really come to fruition by virtue of the fact that the adult market is so crowded now. Um, I think that's true in some sectors. Um, so I think if you look at, um, so on the drug side, that's actually been changing for a while. And that's largely uh, due to some of the FDA incentives around there. So you've seen rare disease, you know, very small market drugs being developed to great success. Um, and that's been going on for a bit. Uh, so that's, I don't know how much things are changing there, but again, it was interesting around JP Morgan where, People were uh, complaining about how awful the market was this year, and it was all doom and gloom. Um, and I noticed that the first day, there were only four deals announced, um, and three of them were pediatric rare disease deals, which was fascinating to me that those were continuing. You know, in the good times, there still may be only those three deals, but those were continuing despite the ups and downs of the market. Um, when it comes to some of the other sectors, um, Look, uh, pediatric sort of you know medical devices 
anything that's sort of a class three medical device, the highly invasive things, those will always continue to be really challenging because it's just hard to develop those for kids. Uh, and a lot of those do tend to be smaller markets and you've got to come at them from a little different angle. Where the change is happening is on the software side. Uh, and people are really waking up to that, that there is all of a sudden, we've, we've always thought about these markets and peds as being small uh, and, and tough to access. But all of a sudden, if you can, with a push of a button, get your solution to a kid in Africa or India or Eastern Europe or wherever, it, it, it changes how you think about it. You don't, you're developing these things for low cost. You uh, uh, can distribute them without spending a lot of money. And you, so you don't need a huge amount of revenue so you can expand your world. And it, it also brings in a nice health equity story, which is, of course, a, a growing theme as well. Um, so I, I've seen a lot of renewed interest there, and I don't know if it's just because, oh, we missed pediatrics before, but it's like, oh, hey, this is interesting. I hadn't quite mm -hmm. thought about this before. And so people are, are generating interest and I'm getting, you compared to five years ago, I'm getting calls all the time for people. It's like, Hey, we're interested in this space. Can you talk to me about it a little bit? So. Great. Thanks, Sean. Um, Maria, I'm going to come back to you because I did say I'd bring this up again, which was really the um, this European action for fast tracking innovation in pediatric and child health. Who's going to lead on that and how do you envisage that's going to go? Because this could be a game changer for medical devices for uh, pediatrics and child health. Yes, so uh, San Juan de Deo is coordinating this proposal, but uh, is really backed up by Aquas uh, and, and EIT Health as um, as uh, experts in the public procurement of innovation. So what we are going to to work on, or we are aiming to, is to really analyze how this pre-commercial procurement of innovation and public procurement of innovation, uh, me in financial mechanisms should be adapted for pediatrics because we understand that some of the phases could be shorter, but some others may be longer. And the support and the need of um, for example, patient engagement, for example, a different type of investors like a, a impact investment funds and all that. So we want to really analyze if we should go for social impact bonds, if the these financial instruments are enough to serve the market, how we can inform or how we can support this needs identification to to take longer and allow all these instruments to be implemented in a in an easier way and also we want to bring um or to raise awareness or or at least to advance because we now know that there is the diga for the digital uh, digital applications reimbursement in in germany or now there is the pecan in italy uh, in france but we are not sure if that implies also children so we really need to find also mechanisms for fast tracking this innovation adoption and uh, support especially for the financial support of the innovation, because as John was saying, it's not that there is not a market, but we believe it should be very much public supported. So the engagement or early engagement of procurers and that procurers support this, um, this unmet need or the evidence uh, for other invest, investors to come on board is what we think it will fast track, no? This this adoption. That's so cool. this is the idea. Thank you, Maria. David, I'm going to move to you. Um, David, I was interested in your Venn diagram and there was marketing and impact. And one of the barriers that if you speak to those developing technology 
child health technology in the UK, in fact, technology generally, but very specifically child health technology, regulation, compliance, health economics are major barriers to getting to market. When you did your research, what was the impression you got about what what is perceived as quite a significant barrier, a hump in the road of trying to get to market and creating impact when it's so difficult to get through the regulatory and compliance process, which I think aligns with what Maria is saying about this fast tracking process i think um i think it may be actually one step further back john um uh, paul which is you know really kind of actually having the um the financial opportunity and the um and the backing of the organization to actually move forward and come up with the innovation in the first place um, before they even get to you know we can't get this through regulation um i think that that is where some of the challenges are uh, at the, at this stage is just really being able to uh sanction the need and uh, to 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 focus on children's innovation um there is and then it, and then it then it comes down to kind of what you know i guess everyone's been saying but where do you want to focus and are there some easy wins you know that as john was saying are there some areas which actually you don't need to go through all of the regulatory elements to 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 look at so you know if you're not talking about um clinical decision support systems you know there's 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 way you know there's ways in which you can actually start getting them to market a lot quicker um but actually i think some of the barriers at this stage are are maybe slightly further further back um of just getting the funding getting the support getting the right people in place um getting the talent to actually um you know want to focus on uh, on children's health in the first place thanks david maria i think you had a comment about from what david had said Yes, I, I wanted to, to back up this statement and also add in for ex with an example. For example, in this in this pre-commercial procurement of innovation or the public procurement, in particular in pediatrics, no, we found we found very low numbers of patients. For example, if we talk about rare diseases, this is why we want to do a cross-border public procurement at the European level, because then you increase the numbers, you can start sharing information. So for harmonization, homogenization, this will fast track also, because you, we need to share information in a safe environment. We need a X number of patients for evidence and an interest from different procurers to share the risk of the investment or the risk of the pre-commercial procurement. So the idea is to, to tell the European Commission that this could be a barrier and they need to invest in, in, in these financial instruments in order to, to really get the innovations uh, adopted. So this is part of the challenges no? that, that I find that sometimes David was saying, you know, even if it's one is worth it, but you need to convince the people and also you need the evidence. So you need a certain number of, of or, or a data set, you know, to prove um, the solution. So this is more or less the idea that for, for example, for COVID, we, and, and it's been told before, we realized that we, did, we didn't have a harmonization. We couldn't share data that well, and that was hindering uh, the analysis of the effects of the vaccines, or et cetera, et cetera. So in kids, imagine is is much more. So we need to remove the burden of the number or the market size by going together in different countries. This is a bit also of the rationale behind. John, can I can I bring you in on this topic because I th I think this is really important one about evidence generation and and early in your talk. Uh, you spoke about evidence generation and there is a bit of a, a challenge here in, in terms of obtaining money or being able to get research, external public money, but then th the process is slow in terms of contracting and, and getting to the point at which you evidence generate. Do investors get a feel that something is going to work. You just get that feeling that there is a technology. It's almost a no brainer. You see it, you get a feel for it, that it's going to work, but the, the developer, the company don't have the money to generate 
the evidence to be able to get it to market. Do investors come in at that early point with that sort of feeling that something might work? Yes. I'll say that cautiously. Um, so going back to sort of the, this, sort of the, the, the first sort of bucket that I talked about, this low-hanging fruit, simple solutions. I think with some of those things, you it's a little easier to sort of just make some guesses about the evidence. It, it, it's a it's a little more self-evident. Um, and you can get your evidence through a few interviews. You don't need to um, yeah, have so, yeah, the, if, something that has a little bit more of a scientific challenge to it. And you may need to go out and uh, your process would be easier if you could go out there and find a natural history study around uh, different kinds of treatments around, you know, uh, yeah, a, a complication of prematurity because you want to develop a, a drug for that. And you just, you, you want to find some you know, evidence around different inter interventions and how yours stacks up. And that gets very, very complicated. Whereas if you've got, um, uh, yeah, the, the company I mentioned earlier that uh, had an exit, a company called Novonate, um, yeah, they have an umbil umbilical catheter securement device. It's pretty straightforward they are replacing tape for securing umbilical catheters um you need a little bit of some very simple evidence uh just that uh your it it gets infected less and uh it doesn't move as much it's a pretty low low bar on that um other things have real problems uh i mean if you start at, have to be running animal studies or looking for data for you know, around rare disease stuff that you have to track down globally it's really hard so to, that's that's sort of a non-answer it depends is the answer sorry thanks sean so i'm going to give the last question to david uh before really david it's the question from john and it's the it's the what one why pediatrics in child health <laughs> well, I thought John was talking to me when he was saying that you've got to be invested in it. I think that well, from a personal perspective, I think um, you described my journey, Paul, at the beginning. So I guess that's uh, um, that's self-evident. Um, you know, I, I don't think I, th I think part of the challenge and I guess coming back in a roundabout kind of way to all of the questions that you've asked, part of the challenge is that that we are lacking in that um, social economic um, kind of uh, um, health economics that we need in order to really show the importance of investing in child health. And once we can get that and everyone understands it and we put it into the hands of government officials and we put it into the hands of investors and everyone can see the you know, the real impact of, of what can happen now, 20, 30, 40, 50, words that you would say yourself, Paul, then, then that is the reason why we should be investing in this. Um, we have a situation whereby the health system doesn't necessarily agree with that status. Um, you know, I was in the US not that long ago, and clinicians don't get paid unless they see patients, right? So we have a, we have a, a, a juxtaposition from that perspective. But, um, you know, unfortunately, I've been on the, obviously, my family and I've been on the receiving end of, of the really bad situations. And I think um, if we can try and help children um, to live a, uh, a healthier, stronger life, then that is going to be good for the economy. It's going to be good for the health services, it's going to be good for everybody moving forward. So um, there's no better place to invest um, but, uh, but you are preaching to the converted, or, or at least, uh, uh, you know, from that point of view. David, Maria, John, thank you ever so much for uh, presenting today. Uh, three fantastic presentations. And a thank you to Bonker as well for her amazing organisation and bringing this together. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining thank us. You, Paul. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I, I just wanted to also to thank the, the speakers. It was a pleasure to, to listen to your uh, insp in, inspire uh, uh, uh presentations uh paul shall we remind the uh the audience about uh our next uh, webinar which will I'll, be I'll leave that to you, thank you thank you paul and uh so our next webinar will be um on immersive uh, reality in child health it will be um 
uh, held in on 14th of uh, November, the same time, 3.30 UK time. And uh, during this event, we will delve into the latest developments in empirical studies surrounding the utilization of immersive and non-immersive uh, virtual reality among child populations. So we are looking forward to seeing you also uh, in our next webinar. Thank you very much, Paul. You were amazing. Thank you for bringing up and for organizing. You organized this. So thank you very much. And thank you for John, Maria and David for um, really for the nice and, and really inspiring uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.